this is such a caring and generous and loving and giving church. Would you agree with that? On my way in this morning, I had evidence again as one of our beautiful girls brought me this from her family to Tanya and me. A lot of good stuff to eat. When I get something like this, just before I preach, I like to hold it up and say, look what I've just been given. Go and do thou likewise. There's a scripture that says that. But then I was convicted by the scripture that says, freely you've received, freely give. I thought that's going to be hard. But isn't that what the Christian life is all about? To count God's blessings, to think of his watchful compassion, his precious word, his spirit in our hearts, and the fellowship of our brothers and sisters. I have received one other thing that I am going to freely give. David Tidwell just handed me this little box with something inside that says it's from Aunt Melody. You can claim it at the back afterwards if you can prove that you have an Aunt Melody. We're talking about evidences of the truth of Scripture, that it's God-breathed, it's inspired, it's without error. We can rely on it. It's never going to change, but it changes us. And we've come today to talk about this morning and this evening in two parts the fact that it portrays the greatest life ever lived. In Galatians 3 and verse 1, Paul chastised the Christians there by saying, Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. He goes on to say, how could you turn from him, not walk with him, not serve him after the picture that you've seen? The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four complementary accounts that fit together and yet each one distinctive from the time that Jesus walked the earth have helped the world to see in clear and graphic detail God in the flesh, in his teaching, his ministry, his healing, his encouragement, his love for people. So that today as we look back at the message that Peter presented, that James just read, we find that those that knew the Lord went everywhere saying they were witnesses. God raised him from the dead and caused him to be Seen not by everyone, but by those who were chosen in advance. And now we're telling you there's forgiveness of sins. Put your faith in him. Obey him. Follow him. He starts by saying, Peter does, you know what's happened in Judea and Jerusalem. He went about doing good. He healed those who were sick. He relieved those that were taken in by the devil. And now Peter has learned from that that God wants all people, all ethnic groups, Jew and Gentile in his day, to come and find the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Philip Yancey wrote, you can judge the effect of a ship by the size of the wake which follows it. The wake is that disturbance of water, as you see in the image here. If you look carefully, way in the distance, you can see what looks like a small ship. It wasn't small when it came through, and you can tell that because the water is still moving behind it. It may seem like there's a distance, there's a time gap between us and the life of Jesus Christ. And yet, when we explore, when we consider, when we see the portrait of his life, and note that through the centuries that have followed, that impact has been larger than any other person that ever walked the earth. We know the Bible is true. It's interesting, the truth of the Bible is confirmed by the four records about Jesus, but the four records of Jesus' life and death and resurrection also verify the Bible. So we can start with Jesus. There was no one like him ever before or ever since. He couldn't have been a mere mortal. He had to be from heaven, 
No one could have invented him. No one could have imagined him. No one could have written some fictional story. It, it's impossible. It has to be real and true. And because of that, and because of what he said about the God of heaven and the prophets and the word that had been given, then we learn through Jesus that, hey, the Bible is right. Every part of it, because that's what Jesus taught. On the other hand, if we start with the scriptures and say, look at the prophecy, look at the unity, look at the accuracy of the word of God, and it's all pointing toward this one portrait of one person so that everything before him looks forward to him and everything after him points back. We may not realize it, but all of the media giants, all of the corporations, all of the communication, everything online, social media, wherever you turn, all of it provides evidence of the influence of Jesus Christ. You can turn on the news. You can read a paper. You can go to a movie or it's a television show, or it's a book, or a magazine, and all of these, every one of them agree that this year is 2019. And that that number is the result of a person in history that changed culture that changed values, that transformed attitudes and lives and people and marriages and families. And whether they'll say it or not, whether they even know, it's because of Jesus Christ that every calendar and everything connected with it gives witness to Him. I received an email this last week. And here's what it said from the largest airline, depending on how you register that. It said, we're going the extra mile. The holiday season is all about giving. Earn bonus miles when you buy or gift. I thought, boy, that's so generous of them. Here they have the word give and the word earn. And that doesn't seem to fit. And the point is, if you'll buy, we'll add to what you're buying. So many ads today say, we're offering you this free. And it really means at no extra charge because you're going to have to buy something to get it. But that's not my point. My point is that whether the author of the ad knew it or whether the leaders of the company knew it, the ad was quoting Jesus Christ. If anyone compels you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Matthew 5, 41. And that phrase and so many others are part of even the secular surroundings today. Well, where'd that come from? And they're so often passed around and heard and spoken that it's just like the year 2019 or, or the second mile. It's become a part of our history, part of our life, part of our world. It's a great paradox when it comes to the life of Jesus. James Francis wrote a piece titled, One Solitary Life. Here's a man born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village, talking, of course, Bethlehem, Nazareth. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for about three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled even 200 miles from the place he was born. He had no credentials but himself. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial, nailed upon a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth when he was dying, and that was his coat. And when he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. All these centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of progress. 
I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that ever were built and all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. It's remarkable to think of the setting into which Jesus came, the Romans in power, or the fact that his own family was poor, or that in that time you couldn't spread a message electronically, that the instruments and tools weren't there, and that his circle was so relatively small and yet by the end of the first century all over Asia even to Greece and Rome the then capital of the world there are those that profess and believe and obey Jesus Christ perhaps you and I are so accustomed to his influence in our lives that we don't always step back like we should and say, wow, a lot of other people have come and gone, tried to leave their mark, but with so many of them, it's like you, you dropped a, a rock in the water and there are a few ripples and then you take the rock out or it sinks and the water's calm again. But with Jesus, the ripples keep going and going and going. In the sermon, the greatest one ever preached, Jesus went up on a mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him and he talked about the poor in spirit, those who mourn and are pure in heart, peacemakers who seek righteousness and are persecuted for the kingdom of God, salt and light, having a heart that serves God from the inside and not simply with outward rules. And on and on and on. And when he finished, the people were astounded. Here was a presentation like they'd never heard before. Instead of Jesus quoting the rabbis and the scribes and the quote experts and the teachers of the law, but I say to you, and, and they were overwhelmed because of the message that Jesus gave. That's where it started. If you turn in your Bible to John chapter 6, the Bible is transparently honest about the opposition to Jesus as well as those that were drawn to him. And so after he fed the 5,000 and many began asking for more food, that's all they could think about was their physical appetite. And Jesus talked about himself as the bread of life. Many of those, in fact, almost all of them deserted him because they found his teaching hard. And Jesus left with the 12, known as the apostles. He said, will you also go away? And Peter replied, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe, we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now turn a page to chapter 7. And we've seen before how here at the Feast of Tabernacles, when the Jews would live in tents or booths for a while to recall their experience long ago in the wilderness, There was controversy, there were arguments, and back and forth, whispering and discussing and disputing. Who is this Jesus? And some say this and some say that. Many of them, because of his signs, began to believe. He, even the Christ couldn't do more than this, perhaps, or even that must be who this is. Well, the Pharisees, on the other hand, they heard this popularity, this growing foment, this surge of interest in Jesus, and they decided to put a stop to it. And so in verse 32, they sent officers to seize him. And what follows next is nothing short of amazing. 
These police, charged with the task of arresting, laying hands on, and bringing in Jesus, instead are empty-handed. And their commanders say, why didn't you bring him in? And their reply was, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Jesus' innocence, purity, his being faultless. This innocence of Jesus was acknowledged by person after person after person. When Pilate washed his hands, and that's another phrase that comes from the Gospels you hear often, I'm washing my hands of that situation, goes back to Pilate. When his wife said, have nothing to do with that innocent man, I've suffered much in a dream because of him. And the governor, Pilate, kept saying, what evil has he done? Why not crucify Barabbas? You talk about polar opposites. He's committed nothing worthy of death. Pilate knew it. Luke tells us that he handed Jesus off to Herod Antipas, the same man who beheaded John the Baptist. And Herod sent him back saying, this man is clean. There's nothing on his record. Judas Iscariot, of all people, when he tries to return the money for his foul betrayal, said, I have betrayed innocent blood, Matthew 27. And that thief hanging beside Jesus told the one beyond him, we're getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. There's a statement in John 8 when Jesus asked his critics, which one of you convicts me of sin? Silence. Jesus' character, Jesus' attitude, Jesus' teaching. You talk about the scrutiny that political leaders are under today in a microscope looking for everything that can be found about this person or that. Don't you know that if the enemies of Jesus could have found something, we'd be reading about it today. And then that centurion, Mark 15, 39. How many people had he seen die on a cross? But this one was different. And when Jesus breathed his last, this possibly hardened Gentile soldier, commander of a hundred, surely this man was the Son of God. Then what we see in Acts is that those who knew Jesus firsthand person to person to person. This is the ripple. This is the wake of, of this ship that now has gone off into the distance. And if you to read in Acts 1.22, we need a replacement for Judas Iscariot who can be a witness with his own eyes to the resurrection of Jesus. Acts 2.32 at Pentecost, Peter said, we are witnesses of these things. And the same in chapter 5.32. And then we saw in chapter 10 regarding Cornelius again and again and again. Cornelius wasn't there as far as we know. He's not that different from us. Even though centuries have passed, Cornelius is hearing the report from someone who was present at the scene. And he came to faith, became a Christian. He and his family baptized that same hour after they heard the wonderful news. In Acts 4, in verse 13, you remember that Peter and John, though uneducated and untrained, they hadn't been through the traditional rabbinic background. Yet there was something about them that indicated for their detractors to see these men have been with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this highlights our mission to the world, doesn't it? 
We learn about Jesus from the Word of God, perhaps through person to person to person to person, going all the way back to the original events. Now we are spreading the ripple effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others, may they be with us and know that we have been with Jesus. It spread through those who knew him. Oh, that wonderful message, that greatest influence of all time that cannot be ignored. As Peter told Cornelius, you yourselves know because they'd heard about it. Jesus went about doing good. What a summary of his life. We're witnesses. God raised him up. We ate and drank with him afterwards. You know, throughout history, we see millions of lives changed because of the impact of Jesus Christ. Nations and cultures transformed. Our own history in the United States of America founded by those that believed these words were true. Values and attitudes redefined because of contact with Him. And institutions all around us that would not be here except for the coming and life and teaching of Jesus Christ. D. James Kennedy wrote a book we'll refer to somewhat this evening in our second part Kind of like it's a wonderful life, he asked the question, what if Jesus had never been born? And discusses what the earth would be like, and it is powerful. Whenever we as Christians talk about Jesus, others may say, well, of course you do, because you believe in him. You're biased. If someone truly understands that Jesus is the greatest person that ever lived on this earth, why wouldn't that person believe and follow him? And yet the fact is that not only those who claim to be followers of Jesus, but those looking, shall we say more objectively, looking from the outside just at what's happened through the years, have made the very same point. You may know of Herbert George Wells, H.G. Wells, as the author of The Time Machine, The War of the Worlds. He was a historian and an author. When he talked about the greatest lives ever lived, speaking of his own perspective, he said, it's interesting and significant that a historian, this is Wells, without any theological bias whatsoever, should find he cannot portray, there's our word portray, the progress of humanity honestly without giving a foremost place to a penniless preacher from Nazareth. The old Roman historians ignored Jesus entirely. They left no impress on the historical records of his time. Yet more than 1,900 years later, Wells wrote, a historian like myself who doesn't even call himself a Christian finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. The historian's test of an individual's greatness is, what did he leave to grow? Did he start men to thinking along fresh lines with a vigor that persisted after him? And then he said, by this test, Jesus stands First. It was C.S. Lewis that wrote long ago, one must choose from the trilemma. Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. I would add, as others have, a fourth L, legend, because of the false concocted stories about how the Bible was somehow altered or corrupted or changed. So many reasons that's not true. One is the documentary evidence that goes all the way back to the earliest of times. Another evidence is that if the Bible were rewritten, 
those favoring Jesus would most likely have eliminated these transparently honest rejections of him and the reasons that people gave for not following. No, the Gospels put us right in the middle of the action. Jesus couldn't be a liar because his words ring true, including going the second mile and all else that he said. He couldn't be a lunatic because of the logic. We'll talk about that this evening. The consistency of his message. And that leaves the L. He is the Lord. That's why only in Jesus will we find the highest principles ever prescribed, the clearest pictures ever painted, the deepest love and grace ever offered, and the costliest pardon ever purchased. The Sermon on the Mount, those principles, those ethics, those values, those guidelines could not have been made up by man. There was nothing like it before or since. No wonder they were amazed. And those pictures in Matthew 13, the farmer scattering seed, the mustard seed growing, the light set where others can see it, the net bringing in people, or that woman in Luke 7 coming to Jesus disheveled, broken, overcome by her sin, pouring out her life and her ointment and her tears at his feet. When no one else would touch her, Jesus let her touch him. And he said, go in faith, go in peace. Your faith has saved you. And then at the cross, we're not surprised that centurion were, was amazed. We're still amazed at what Jesus Christ did when he gave his life for us. From the very beginning, when the gospel was preached, the message was offered, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be saved from this corrupt generation. That invitation is ours again today. Shall we stand and sing?